during the crack epidemic, the police attitude was to kill and arrest and arrest anybody that's found in a crack house or in a house where an attic may have crack and could be your grandmama's house and she had nothing to do with crack, but they were arrested anyway. But the police have become kinder and more gentler when it comes down to the opioid addicts of today. This article that came out in the Miami Herald is a good example of that, ladies and gentlemen. Miami police say they'll offer opioid addicts rehab instead of arresting them a whole different attitude is displayed today towards opioid addicts. In the fight against the opioid plague, ravishing the nation, Miami officials hope to use law enforcement to steer people into medical care instead of jail. Miami police plan to offer people with opioid addictions a chance to go ahead to rehab instead of arresting them under a new program announced Monday. See that, y'all? They came up with a whole new program using a pair of federal grants totaling about $1.6 million dollars. The police department will be working with Jackson Behavioral Health Hospital in South Florida Behavioral Health Network, the University of Miami Health System, and then other agencies to develop pre-arrest diversion programs where people found with small amounts of opioids can enter a one-year outpatient treatment program. But people found with small amounts of marijuana will still be locked up. Let's go on. Which would include anti-addict medication. Well, it says anti-addiction, but you know, anti-addict medication, social services, medical health counseling, and general medical care. But those of you found with marijuana, you will get a free ride in back of a squad car, courtesy handcuffs, and taken to your local prison facility for labor for many, many years. Police and six officials expect to spend the next six months hiring personnel, setting up the program, and training officers in order to start offering treatment by May 2019. Dr. Patricia Arez Romero, Chief Medical Officer of the Behavioral Health Hospital, said the program could treat around 100 people over the three-year life of the grant. Much of the treatment will be outpatient, but the program will have some capacity for inpatient care. So, ladies and gentlemen, they have found a way to treat these opioid addicts, allowing them to be free and get help at the same time. So when they see the police coming, they have no fear of being roughed up and put in the back of a squad car like someone that's been carrying a little bit of weed gets roughed up and put in the back of a squad car. 
All right, I have an audio file that I'm going to let you listen to. It's so right to look at the motivation as opposed to just the availability. And I think like all things, we can't just look to government for a solution. I think that the problem is... Um, Wholly, there is there is a moral and cultural disintegration uh, uh, within American culture right now, and I would point people to um, a book uh, called uh, Coming Apart. Coming Apart looked at America really in the early 1960s, the pre-JFK uh, assassination America, and what you notice there is that um, middle class white Americans had a very different reality than what they do today. Today, where over the past 100 years, um, people have been living longer thanks to amazing advancements. In and, you know, technology, science, and 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 healthcare, what what have you? But there's one group which, lo and behold, um, they're dying in an untimely fashion, and that's that's white uh, middle class men. Specifically, since I think about 1999, we've seen a really really sharp uptick in this particular population um, dying in an untimely fashion, mostly because of, as you put it, um, deaths of de despair. Opioids is, is one of the crises as well as alcoholism and just suicide uh, point blank. And uh, when you look at, at what has changed since then, you're so right in saying, you know, this anti-white bias and, and ethos on, you know, the university campuses and our press, etc. But if you just look at the civic culture that used to exist in pre, let's say, 1963 America to now, despite where you were along the, the social, political, uh, economic class, there was a unitive uh, culture, that, a civic culture that brought America together, and where if you looked at marriage rates, at employment rates, and, and frankly, church uh, going uh, rates, uh, there, there were um, consistencies and there were populations that were much higher and different than what they are today. And I'll give you an example. For instance, the, the foundational institution of any society is, of course, marriage, which I believe should be and remain um, as it is traditionally uh, described one man and one woman. But um, if you look at, you know, early 1960s America, what you'll see is that middle class um, white men were married to the tune of 85 to 95 percent of the population. Today, middle class white men, their uh, marriage rates are 48 percent. OK, uh, if you look at the stigmas around work back then, if you were unemployed, frankly, your parents or your wife, if you were in the civilizing institution of marriage, you, they would tell you that you're a bum. Get up off your butt and go and get a job. Whereas now we're like, it's cool. You can sit around and, well, hey, guess what happens then if you have any access to some of these illegal drugs or even legally prescribed drugs? And don't get me started on big pharma here. And also when it comes to to the church, the church, uh, I mean, there, there were rates where at least 50 to 60 percent of Americans said that they went to church at least, you know, the weekend before polled, where Whereas today, those numbers have fallen like a rock. And so um, when you see this entire cultural breakdown, it's no wonder that the white male without a wife, uh, without a job, uh, although we, some of the employment rates have, have gotten a little bit better under Trump, thank God, um, and without a, a, a very intimate social security net and, and moral compass provided to them in some sort of a religious, preferably Christian institution, are left wondering. Oh, you know, it's it's man's search for meaning. It's the oldest, you know, question that that philosophers um, since the dawn of time have contemplated. They're sitting there sucked of any sort of meaning and so while well, they're turning to to numbing um, uh, products, you know, opio opio opioids rather come from opium. Uh, opium comes from, from, from the poppy. Poppy is called the joy plant, right? They, they, they don't have any joy in their life because we've told them that all the traditional forms of, of reaching joy and, and some sort of eudaimonia, so to speak, um, are wrong. And so this is your solution, white male. Um, go numb by taking opioids and get sucked up into this new vortex. But good, props to Trump for at least drawing some attention to it. I think that it's important too that we underscore the fact that it's not just white men that are being affected by this, but white females as well, because um, they're part of the household. And so when these men's lives are basically cut short, that totally disintegrates their entire family unit. I was watching this one clip in preparation for the program today. Uh, PBS ran a story and it was all these white towns um, that had 
horror stories. These women who said that their their sons had essentially taken the I mean, sons that were in their, their early 40s had taken their lives and then their husbands later felt personally responsible. And so they took their lives in different ways, whether it be alcohol or opioids. And you see total destructions of these communities, which have seen like three, four hundred percent increases in white middle aged working class men coming through the emergency room. And so these sorts of I mean, it's one thing to talk about it from a national statistics sort of, you know, bird's eye view. But for, I mean, a lot of specifically flyover country, this is very much a reality. And I think you're so right, Nick, in saying the fact that this is going to be a factor um, in the next election when a hundred, like basically white men of working class are dying. I think it's like around a day in this country. It's something ridiculous. It really is an epidemic. Um, these are real homes lives and communities that are being affected and so thank god for for, for making for trump making a a a you know a, bring some light to it shining some light on it but i do think it's going to be up to civil society to fix these problems i think they're going to have to be groups that that come out and start talking about it and making meaningful whether it be men's groups in community centers whatever it is but making uh, you know that sort of um fulfillment that young men get from playing video games this idea of like fraternity and community loyalty and honor and being able to do something well we have to be able to mimic that in the real world without you know necessarily sending these men to real war um and help them feel a sense of community and purpose uh, in a way that, frankly, government uh, can't fill that void. Civil, civil society has to.